Thanks for the invitation and thanks for this opportunity to introduce this work at our conference. Uh, before we start the actual talk, it might be helpful to just uh, briefly explain the motivation of this work. Um, so we all know that there are many different ways to define uh, the cohomology of a finite dimensional closed oriented manifold. Um, and one possible approach to use a Morse function on this manifold. Uh, it was Witten's original idea that if we only want to define this Morse cohomology, it suffices to uh, just count critical points and suitable negative gradient flow lines of this Morse function. Then uh, Floor realized that this particular approach can be uh, generalized to suitable infinite dimensional cases, um, producing powerful invariance in both simplexity topology and low dimensional topology. And our question here is how do we complexify this story? Um, so what if we have a Kähler manifold and a holomorphic Morse function? Um, then what kind of algebraic invariance we're supposed to define for such a pair? Uh, this pair is uh, usually called landau ginzburg models in the literature. Um, as we will see in just a moment, uh, if we just consider the Morse cohomology of a holomorphic Morse function, then uh, it will be rather boring because essentially you are just counting the number of critical points. Um, but um, thanks to the work of Paul, in the finite dimensional case, we actually have a very good answer to that question. So we should really define the foucault saddle category of a landau ginzburg model. And in our context, this just means uh, directed infinity category with finitely many objects. And the end point of this project is to generalize uh, a well-known result in simplexity topology to help us understand several weight and gauge theory. Um, so this project is not fully accomplished yet, but it still seems pretty promising. So uh, let me start with the first part of the talk um, and explain the expectation from the finite dimensional case. So let me start with the definition. Um, an LG model um, is simply a pair Uh, where M uh, is a non-compact, complete uh, Kähler manifold, um, and W uh, is a holomorphic Morse function defined on M. It's also called the superpotential in the literature. Um, so I, I will use L to denote the real part and H for the imaginary part. And here the Morse condition just saying that the real part of the superpotential is the Morse function in the ordinary sense. So it doesn't matter uh, whether you use the real or the imaginary part because the kirchhoff riemann equation says they have the same critical set. Um, at this point, we need some extra condition for this uh, Landau Ginzburg model. Uh, for instance, I, I want this Kähler manifold to have bounded geometry and also want this symplectic manifold to be exact. This means uh, the symplectic two form is a differential of, of some smooth one form called primitive. I also want this function, uh, the norm of this gradient vector field lambda h, uh, to be a proper function on the Kähler manifold. Um, this implies in particular that there are only finitely many critical points for this holomorphic Morse function. Um, in practice, uh, we have to be a little bit more precise about the growth rate of this function at infinity. Um, it cannot just grow too slow or too fast. Um, but uh, I don't plan to elaborate on this. Uh, let me just say there are some other assumptions here. They help us control on the geometry of this landau ginzburg model at infinity. Uh, it's more enlightening to just have a few uh, examples in mind. Um, so for the first one, let's take M to be Cn, and the superpotential is the sum of uh, the I squared. Okay. Then the origin is the unique critical point as a non-degenerate. And for the next one, uh, let's take M to be C, and W uh, is just a polynomial. And the Morse condition in this case uh, just says um, the first derivative of the superpotential um, has only simple zeros. Okay. And the first example is always the local model near a critical point of this holomorphic Morse function. 
Uh, let me give you uh, two more infinite dimensional examples. So for the first one, uh, let's take Y to be any closed oriented three manifold. Um, then M, uh, this is um, the space of um, all um, SL2C connections. Um, so th this is um, infinite dimensional uh, alpha and complex uh, subspace. So this means um, so any element in this Kähler manifold takes the form on the trivial differential plus some smooth one form, and B uh, takes value in uh, the D algebra of SL2C. So the topolog topology of this space is rather simple. Um, the superpotential in this case is the so-called uh, the complex uh, transcendence functional. Um, so the next example is more relevant with our suburb weighting equations. So let's take uh, sigma to be a closed Riemann surface. of uh, some genus G. And let's also choose a line bundle over the surface. Of some degree D. Then in this case, um, um, M is still modeled on an infinite dimensional complex vector space. So an element in M is really a triple where B is a U1 connection on L and B plus is a smooth section of this line bundle and B minus is a smooth zero one form um, taking value in this line bundle L. The superpotential in this case is called a Dirac functional And its definition is rather simple. So given any triple like this, um, uh, you first apply the D-bar operator of B to B plus. Then you take the Hermitian inner product with phi minus. Then you take uh, the integral over the whole surface. Um, then you multiply a normalizing constant. So this function on the nose is not really a Morse function. So you have to add a super perturbation to make it Morse. And we usually do this by choosing a harmonic one form on the surface. Uh, so there is a caveat uh, when working with gauge theory, because there is always an infinite dimensional Lie group acting on the Kähler manifold. So um, we are secretly working with so-called gauged LG models. Um, but uh, the generalization to go from the ordinary version to the gauge version is not so significant. So I won't really emphasize the distinction in uh, our talk today. So returning to the finite dimensional case, we should really think of uh, this superpotential as a projection map onto C. So um, the fiber over a generic point is really a smooth complex manifold of M. But there are a few singular fibers, um, one for each critical point of the superpotential. Um, 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 within this Kähler manifold, uh, there exists a distinguished uh, class of Lagrangian sum manifolds called thimbles. They are simply defined as the unstable or a stable submanifold of the real part of that view. Um, so uh, for each critical point, uh, there is a pair of stable and unstable thimbles. So this is the right, um, so this red one is a picture for the stable thimble and its projection onto the complex plane is always a ray emanating from this critical value. And the reason is um, 
the function edge, the imaginary part, is always constant as such a symbol. And if we work instead with um, the unstable one, the projection would be array pointing towards uh, the opposite direction. And from now on, uh, I will only draw the picture downstairs on C. So I will use um, a critical value to secretly represent uh, the critical point upstairs. And for each of them, uh, there is a pair of stable and unstable symbols. Um, symbols are very important. They are like Lagrangian sum manifolds, and they generate the Foucault category of uh, this left wrist variation in a suitable sense. Um, this implies, in particular, that the Morse index of each critical point uh, is uh, always half of the dimension of the total space. Um, and so, here we, let's make one extra condition here. So, let's assume the value of H uh, are all distinct for these critical points. And this condition further implies that there are basically no flow lines going between two critical points. So the Morse homology of this real part uh, is just counting the number of critical points. So if you go back to this example, a critical point of this complex chain Simons functional is actually a flight SL2C connection. So it defines a pairwise representation of the fun of this three manifold into SL2C. And essentially, you are just counting um, um, pipeline representations. So this is relevant with the work of Abzaid and Manolescu, uh, a shift theoretical model of SL2C for cohomology. Um, so the problem is that it's not guaranteed that this complex transamos functional is always Morse. So you have to introduce some extra technique to make a reasonable count. Um, for this, the last example here, um, the critical points of this direct functional uh, do not really have a very good geometric meaning. Um, but you can compute rather concretely that up to gauge, uh, this critical side um, has uh, precisely uh, 2G minus 2 choose D uh, critical orbits. So you can make everything very explicit for this direct functional. So returning to the finite dimensional case once again, so in 2008, um, Paul proved the following theorem using his uh, deep generating theorem for the Foucault category in his book. So uh, for any um, compact exact Lagrangian sum manifold in M, um, so here exact means uh, when we restrict the primitive one form on X and on Y, uh, there are going to be some exact forms Then there exists a, a, a spectral sequence uh, converging to uh, Lagrangian focal homology between X and Y, and whose U on page is given by this direct sum. So, and each sum end is given by the focal homology of X uh, with SJ tensored with the focal homology between UJ reply. And this summation is over all critical points of the superpotential. So you should really think of this result as a computational tool to help us um, compute the focal homology between X and Y. And the moral is if we understand how, it, how this um, the first Lagrangian X interact with all stable symbols and how the second Lagrangian intersect with all unstable symbols, uh, then we can compute uh, each page of this spectral sequence step by step and eventually compute this infinite page. Um, and the upshot is only finite, a uh, finite amount of information uh, for X and Y is required in this computation. And our goal is to uh, generalize this result to suitable infinite dimensional cases. So this complex chain Simons functional is extremely difficult to work with, but uh, this example might be uh, promising. Um, so we have to really 
um, do it the right way to make this generalization possible. So um, Paul's original approach uh, to this um, theorem um, relies on his uh, generating theorem. So it's only constructed algebraically. So I will call this uh, the algebraic spectral sequence for the rest of the talk. Um, also in his proof, he used some notion like uh, symplectic parallel transformation and the symplectic then twist along a Lagrangian sphere. And, and I don't really know how to uh, generalize those notions to the infinite dimensional case. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I would like to uh, um, describe alternative approach to this spectral sequence. And in particular, I wish to see the filtration on this coaching complex rather ex explicitly. And to this end, um, I really have to explain um, the construction of this four cohomology groups. So before I go any further, are there any questions so far about this setup? Yes? Mm -hmm. Great, so you have to choose the complex structure very carefully to make this guy holomorphic. So uh, the complex structure J would be the, uh, for the first entry is Hodge star, the second entry uh, I, this last one minus I. Very good question. So this is the second part this talk. So let's start with the last group, um, the coaching complex between X and Y. Uh, traditionally, this is defined um, by counting on uh, J holomorphic strips. So they are simply um, smooth maps from this infinite strip into the Kähler manifold and they are subject to the cauchy riemann equation. And we have Lagrangian boundary conditions along, um, S, along um, when S is equal to zero and equal to R. So this equation is conformally invariant, so it doesn't really matter which length parameter you choose here. But in order to see the filtration concretely, I really have to perturb this equation using the superpotential. So at this point, I will use uh, the gradient vector field of H. And then uh, this equation is not conformally invariant anymore, so the choice of R becomes important. So let me add a subscript here to indicate the dependence. So uh, I will call this equation the floor equation in this talk. Um, so uh, to some extent, uh, this perturbation seems to be a more natural equation to consider for uh, London Gensler models. For instance, uh, for uh, the complex transcendence functional, uh, this floor equation uh, will recover the so-called uh, Hades written equations. On this product phi manifold, uh, Z cross Y. And for the Dirac functional, on this floor equation, we'll recover our favorite uh, several weighting equations. on this product four manifold Z cross sigma. So as I mentioned earlier, if you want to work with uh, gauge theory, there are some infinite dimensional Lie groups acting on this basis, and we have completely ignored this action in our uh, discussion so far. So uh, this reduction or specialization are not so accurate, but it's harmless to think of this floor equation um, as a, a toy model for this gauge theoretical equations. And this particular perturbation will produce the right filtration for us. Um, so this is the construction for the last group. So what about the other two? Uh, 
another difficulty in generalizing um, this result to the infinite dimensional case is really about the Lagrangian boundary condition. Uh, infinite dimensional Lagrangian sum manifolds are extremely annoying to work with, so I would like to get rid of the boundary condition whenever possible. So in this case, X and Y are just some general Lagrangian sum manifolds, so I cannot say too much about them. But um, let's say for the first group of there, um, which is between X and SJ, so the second entry is a symbol. So uh, we can propose an alternative rule for this coaching complex. So this time, I'm going to study this um, floor equation on the upper half plane. Uh, we still have a Lagrangian boundary condition along the real line. Um, but the other part is replaced by an asymptotic condition at infinity. So I want this solution to converge to our critical point, QJ, if we go up vertically upward. So if let S goes to past infinity, this would be our critical point, QJ. And uh, this co convergence would be uh, exponential and uniform in the time variable. At this point, you may wonder why um, this um, upper half plan model is producing the same for a cohomology group for us. So let me try to provide some heuristics here. So to simplify the situation, let's suppose um, that uh, the time derivative of u is identically zero. So we set this derivative to zero in the equation. Then the Cauchy-Riemann equation says lambda h is also j of lambda l. So this floor equation implies that um, the spatial derivative of u plus lambda l is equal to zero. So this means if you go upwards here, you are following the naked gradient flow of the real part. So let's give them a name. So they are called uh, solitons because they are solutions independent of the time. And we use uh, C of um, x comma sj. Um, Uh, to denote the space of all solitons. Okay. So it follows the naked gradient flow of L, um, the initial point less on X, and the limit as um, S goes to infinity is the critical point QJ. So if you think very carefully about this initial point, this corresponds to a general intersection of um, this Lagrangian sum manifold X with a stable symbol. So this is still aligned with the traditional Lagrangian intersection theory. And in a similar way, let's define the other group by counting solutions on the lower half plan. So we still have a boundary condition along the real line, but the other guy is uh, replaced by asymptotic condition as S goes to negative infinity. So we are always using the same uh, floor equation. Okay. And we again use uh, C of uh, uj comma y to denote um, the space of solitons. Um, and if you think carefully about this ending point, uh, this corresponds to a, a genuine intersection of Y with the unstable symbol. And finally, uh, we use uh, C sub R to denote uh, the space of solitons for um, the first group. Um, 
at this point, you may wonder why am I changing the setup like this? And you'll see this immediately, uh, some magic is going to happen. So there are two uh, basic observations at this point. Um, so for any R sub G large, there is a very nice decomposition for this space. So C sub R can be decomposed as this disjoint union. And each sum uh, is in bijection with uh, C of X comma SJ cross C of UJ cross Y. Um, so, yes? of y is in the, so it's always along the other boundary component. X and y are fixed. I will take r to be large instead. I'm stretching the neck. It's, well, Eventually, um, alternatively, you can fix the domain and you put some R here, right? So if you take R to be zero, it just recovers the ordinary occasion in my equation. So you, you take this one to be one, you take this, you multiply some big R over here. So you're just rescaling the domain. X and Y can intersect. So, um, so this bijection follows from the standard Green theorem from um, in um, morris witten theory. So a flow line that goes from X to Y will eventually degenerate into a broken flow line that passes through some critical point QJ. And our assumption here implies that only one break is possible. And you can choose uh, which critical point um, this flow line is converging to in the middle of this large interval. So you see this decomposition. And this bijection is simply given by the gluing theorem. So the first, the second observation is equally simple, but it's slightly more uh, substantial. So by the first step, uh, we can decompose the coaching complex uh, between X and Y as this direct sum. Um, and VJ is just freely generated by uh, this sum. So here comes the question. So this is the coaching group. What about the differential? Um, to understand the structure of differential, so let's take a look with the action functional. So you can think of this uh, for cohomology as the Morse cohomology as an infinite dimensional space. And the functional is the st standard symplectic action functional. And this is the only place we need to see this formula. So uh, this formula takes the following form. So there are basically four different terms. So at the beginning, we see the value of hx and h sub y. The third one is the integral of uh, the primitive one form. And the last one uh, is the integral of the value of h. OK, so here is my question. Suppose uh, this solid tongue less in the j sum and what's the approximate value of this action functional? So the, um, I think all of you can figure this out in just 10 minutes. But I will spoil the question anyway. So um, suppose gamma less in um, the J summon, then the answer is uh, this action fun functional is equal to R times H of QJ plus big O of one. The reason is also straightforward because as R goes to infinity, uh, this uh, flow line gamma will converge to a broken trajectory like this. This means that the first three pieces will actually converge as R goes to infinity. Um, but the last term will actually blow up. And the reason is um, this path 
on gamma is almost a constant path at this critical point qj. This means this function h is almost constant at the value h of qj. And when you integrate over this large interval, you see this linear order term. And all remaining terms are going to be bounded. Okay. So this property is very important um, because uh, the floor differential can only increase the value of the action functional. This means if r is sufficiently large, um, the floor differential can only increase the value of h. So let's come back to this picture. So for each of these critical points, uh, we have a summon uh, v1, v2, and v3. Um, and there might be some floor differential preserving each summon. That's completely possible. And there might be something that uh, increase the value of h, but there can't be anything going backwards. This means under this decomposition, this is a lower triangular matrix inducing a spectral sequence. So here comes to the main result of this talk. So uh, for any R sufficiently large, um, this energy filtration uh, induces a sp geometric spectral sequence. It starts with um, the cohomology of this summon and converging to the four cohomology um, between x and y. Moreover, uh, you can compute the first page of the spectral sequence rather explicitly. So the cohomology of each summon is uh, isomorphic to this tensor product. So we have already seen uh, such an isomorphism between their chain groups. And the claim is that you can also identify their comp uh, complexes. So you can identify their differential maps under this next stretching limit. Um, so th um, the second statement is this geometric spectral sequence um, is um, isomorphic to pulse uh, algebraic spectral sequence. So if we just want a spectral sequence, then part one is already good. Uh, it implies a rank inequality between the E1 and the infinity page. But the problem is that uh, this filtration, geometric filtration itself, didn't say anything about the structure, about hair differentials. Suppose uh, we want an algebraic prescription to really understand the differential on each page and eventually compute this uh, for a homology group then this algebraic spectral sequence becomes more fundamental. Um, and in order to pursue some result like this, we really have to define the Foucault saddle category of a Landau-Gains model within this framework. Um, so before I move to the next part, are there any questions so far about this statement, and especially about the origin of the filtration? This is really the main takeaway from the talk. By the symplectic action functional, right? So the four cohomology is uh, the Morse cohomology of the action functional, right? And I can estimate the approximate value of this action functional for each summon. So the leading order term is going to be very important. I think um, I'm running out of time, so I will just give you the statement um, of um, the result. 
So in our case, uh, the Foucault-Sello category of this long dog Ginsburg model just mean um, um, directed and infinite category with finitely, om finitely many objects, and these objects are given just by these all stable symbols. Uh, they are ordered to increase the value of H. And this infinite category is directed means that the home space uh, between SJ and SK um, is zero if J is greater than K and is uh, generated by the strict unit if J is equal to K and is given by the coaching complex when J is less than K. So only something interesting happens in the last case. Um, at this point, you see another problem. So these symbols don't intersect at all in the Keller manifold, right? So uh, what's the plan? Uh, we have to do some very interesting perturbation to this picture. And I would like to rotate each symbol anti-clockwise by a very small amount. So this means, um, so this is the perturbed picture. So let's fix a base point that is far away in the real direction. And I would like to ask all perturbed symbols to pass through this base point. So this means uh, we have to choose uh, some small angles, fit one, fit two, fit three, and fit four, one for each critical point. And I would like to replace uh, each uh, st stable symbol uh, by um, SJ prime, and this is defined, uh, let's first rotate by the superpotential W by this unit complex number, e to the minus I theta J, then we take the real part and define SJ prime to be um, the stable sum manifold of this guy. And then uh, I just replace everything by these perturbed symbols. And the consequence of this perturbation is that um, if you think about the projection of each uh, stable symbols this time, uh, they are now pointing towards the direction of EI theta j. And we do the same thing for all unstable symbols. At this point, uh, you can just work with um, Lagrangian boundary condition to define uh, these groups. Uh, but since they are all symbols, there is a way to really get rid of Lagrangian boundary conditions. And, by, and this is done by considering some interesting perturbation of the previous floor equation on, on R2. Okay. Um, but uh, let me skip that part in this talk. Um, there are a few more ingredients uh, in this algebraic spectral sequence. So let's um, also define the Kwasu Du category of, uh, of this LG model. So this is defined all using all um, unstable symbols. So the rows between stable and unstable symbols are pretty symmetric at, at this point. Uh, the next one is more interesting. We want a, a diagonal bimodule. Um, for A and B. Um, so, so this bimodule is defined by putting all stable and unstable symbols together. And by definition, uh, for a bimodule, I have to assign a chain complex uh, between uh, each pair, uh, UK and SJ. Um, in this case, uh, this is just the co-chain complex. Um, um, this guy is called the diagonal bimodule because this complex has a particularly simple structure. So it is zero if J is not equal to K and is uh, one dimensional when J is equal to K. And the reason is rather simple. So if you choose different indices, uh, then the symbols, stable and unstable symbols, they don't intersect at all in the Keller manifold. But if you choose J equals to K, then they intersect at a unique uh, critical point, QJ. And so the stable, so um, the Foucault's 
saddle category A and B, they pre behave pretty much like um, the, a basis of vector space and a dual basis of the dual vector space. And this diagonal bimodule somehow manifests the duality, causal duality pattern between A and B. So basically, one determines the other. And finally, for X, um, I want to associate um, a, a infinity left module over A. And for the second Lagrangian, uh, I want a uh, right B module. And this point, uh, we are ready to state the refinement of the theorem. So this is really a chain level going theorem. So for any R sufficiently large, there exists a quasi-isomorphism that goes from this coaching complex between X and Y to this huge complex built out of the A infinity data. So here, uh, P is the BJ category of um, left A module. And Q is the BJ category of right B module. Moreover, on the left-hand side, we have the geometric filtration induced by the action functional. And on the right-hand side, we have the algebraic spectral uh, filtration induced from this uh, right B module. So for any right B module, there is a canonical way to filter this right B module by a sequence of some modules. And this induces the algebraic filtration on the right-hand side. And this uh, quasi-asomorphism identifies these two filtrations. Uh, finally, uh, for this result, you can simply ask X and Y to be compact. This is completely fine, but we can also be a slightly more general. So we can ask instead that the real part of the superpotential X is bounded from above, and on Y is bounded from below. So in this picture, so the only thing we know about Y is the projection is bounded from below in the real direction. And for x, uh, we only know it's bounded from above. And this is the reason I have been using different um, modules for x and y, because uh, they are not symmetric at this point. Um, so um, in the last minute, uh, let me just explain briefly the dictionary between uh, symplectic topology and several weaken gauge theory. So for uh, the symplectic action functional, a configuration is a path that goes from x to y. And in several weaken gauge theory, so this x is replaced by a three manifold with a boundary y1. And this interval is replaced by an interval um, across uh, this boundary Riemann surface. So it could be disconnected, and Y is replaced by another three manifold with boundary. Okay. And the action functional is then replaced by chain Simon's Dirac functional. And the floor equation uh, is replaced by the several written equation on this uh, three manifold across R. Okay. Um, so uh, when you change uh, the length of this um, interval, um, so making it longer and longer, uh, you are secretly uh, stretching a neck for this three manifold. You are uh, changing the metric. And you will also see a similar um, energy filtration for the transformers Dirac functional if you, well, have a very interesting perturbation in the middle. Um, so the 
geometric spectral sequence um, is always easy. So we always have this spectral sequence. And the real challenge is to generalize the pulse algebraic spectral uh, framework to um, this situation. So this part is not fully accomplished yet, but it seems pretty promising at this point. Um, so at the very end of talk, I have to say that um, I'm very fortunate to benefit both from the work of Tom and Paul um, when I was a student at MIT. I remember that um, in my third year, uh, I came to Tom's office and said, in order to understand the separate weighting equations on a complex plane across a compact Riemann surface, um, the correct finite dimensional model uh, is to uh, start with a killer manifold with a holomorphic Morse function. And Tom started to explain to me that this is called a Landau Ginzburg model, and I started to learn um, Paul's work on Leftist vibrations and Foucault categories. And um, I think it's quite remarkable to see such a connection between their work, and I hope I can tell you a more complete story in the near future. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. One second, okay. So the, the, the point is um, uh, we have the decomposition. So for the coaching complex between X and Y is freely generated by the space of solitons. And we can have a decomposition like this. And this is because um, each flow line will eventually converge to a broken trajectory um, that goes from um, so it initially goes from x then to some critical point, then into the second Lagrangian. And the upshot is, so this, at this point, you really have to see the formula. So the action functional um, for a gamma in the J summon is approximately R times H of QJ. So this is a very simple but very important observation. Then, um, the differential can only increase the value of edge. Yeah. Well, so th this formula is already suggesting um, such a border multiple floor theory, but it's not going to be a very general result. So imagine that we can define uh, for the direct functional from for. Um, for some A infinity categories A and B, and for Y1 and Y2, you can define these left and the right modules, and you, can, you also have this diagonal bimodule in the middle. So this is already somehow the gluing formula for uh, multiple fur homology, but the point is um, the direct functional is not really a like, uh, super potential onto C, so it's really a left wrist vibration over two torus. So in some sense, we have to develop a picard leftist novikov theory. Um, and so anyway, so it's going to be a little bit more complicated than this. 